Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast. I am Race for the Prize. Today we're going to get you prepared early for Bristol. We're breaking down last year's Bristol race. You don't need to watch the race again. I'm going to tell you everything every driver did as quickly as possible. But first, raceforthepriz.com. That's where you can go to get access to the Fantasy NASCAR spreadsheet. 27 bucks for the month of March. You want to do some pro rating? Email me. DM me. Let's look at this race. Last fall at Bristol night race. It was a green race. It was a playoff race. That being said, they were deferential lappers, people that didn't want to mess with the playoff drivers. You could make a strong case that spring races at Bristol are different. You could make the case that lappers are much more of a handful. And even now, it's been a while since we had a spring Bristol race. The mid-pack, the guys that are going to be getting lapped, are pretty decent drivers. Leaders can be taken out. So you could make a strong argument that I don't care what happened in that fall playoff race. It's going to race a little bit differently. We won't get a big green flag race. Fair fair enough. But if it does go green, then what happened last fall, the results should be very telling. If we look at the top 10, you can't really see it here, but you can. Eight of the top 10 in terms of finish all started within the top 10. Repeat, eight of the drivers that finished inside the top 10 started inside the top 10. Track position matters. Track position matters. There was very limited passing. I'll give you an example on the screen, although I've already tweeted this out. When we go green, I mean, you can even see it right now. The numbers aren't changing. This is stage two. No one is moving inside the top 10. No one's moving outside of the top 10 or even further back. Here we go into stage three. The numbers aren't changing. It's static. There isn't passing. Track position matters. But that is only half of the story. Since you couldn't pass on track, the only real changes in position came on pit road. Not necessarily because you were the fastest, although in stage two and stage three, there will be some shuffling of the deck chairs in the front because of fast pit stops and new guys will jump to the lead. But the most significant change is going to be early in the race. And we have a sequence of three cautions, a caution on lap 70, a caution for red because of rain. And then the end of stage one, which also turns into a rain caution. How you scheduled your pit stops determined your race. End of story. Now you're going to notice on the left side of the screen, we've got all these guys in yellow and one guy in white. What does that mean? Those are the drivers that sequenced the pit stops correctly. And the cheat code, your contra code, up, up, down, down, Left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B. I go select start because I play with a buddy. The correct sequence was, drum roll please, pit, stay out, stay out. What does that mean on the screen? You pit under yellow, you lose all your track position. Like Mr. Ye Yellen, what? Den I'm saying Denny Hamlin backwards or something like that. Denny Hamlin goes from second, drops all the way to 28th. Oh, no. And then he stays out. Now he's in 18th. Then he stays out. He's back in ninth. And uh, we'll talk more about Hamlin in a second. But that's it. And you can see all these other drivers did that. If you are in yellow, you played the sequencing correctly. We will go through all the drivers. Now, some guys will with a slight modification. The key was to stay out right here. Now, I say that not because it really matters that much in the grand scheme of things, but if you don't go very far into the podcast and you're looking guys in the top 10 and just are going to automatically assume, well, he must be really good at Bristol. While most of the drivers inside the top 10 at Bristol last year are good drivers at Bristol, you do need to remember that track position was huge. So maybe you factor that into your selecting process for the spring race. But also pit sequencing, which we can't really predict. But we can sort of, like, oh, we don't know what kind of strategy they're going to do. Well, guys in the top 10 are mainly going to go with the follow the leader strategy. And if you have track position, you can be pretty conservative. Now, we don't know that it's always going to play out in their favor. 
but I think you can tie those two things together, track position, conservative pit sequencing, as long as things don't get too hairy, uh, that should work out. So then it, you know, that snake's eating its own neck again, or its own head, and you roll back to, well, track position matters. It's almost like a little cycle there of, well, if you have track position, uh, conservative, follow the leader type of pit sequencing, and that should work out for a good track position, and you hold on and get a good finish, in theory. That may not be true. It definitely is not going to happen if the race gets hairy. But if the race gets hairy and it turns into a spring race, it's pretty wild. And there is some data suggests that the spring races can be a lot more chaotic. I went through a bunch of the different cautions. I'll talk about those in a different podcast. But there is a legitimate argument that spring race afternoon gets a little bit more wild and weird. And track position may not be as significant. We may see more comers and goers, not really comers and goers, than just people who survive. Let's break down the race. As I suggested earlier, Denny Hamlin does a sequence right. But the thing that Hamlin does that no one else really does is he drives through the pack in the top 10. Making passes in the top 10 in NASCAR is very difficult. Doing so at Bristol is very difficult. Doing so on this night at Bristol is very difficult. He gets himself there. He drives himself to the lead. He 100% earns the lead. And so as we look forward to this year's Bristol race, we have to be pretty encouraged by what Hamlin was able to accomplish. Very strong race. Kyle Larson finishes second. Another driver that's always good here drives from 36th to 20th. So congratulations. Pretty good. Pretty solid, but really not that difficult to do. Then he pits, stays out, stays out, has a wonderful pit stop. Now up to second place, drops a little bit. Drives back up, gets to first, loses the lead to Christopher Bell, and then he's pretty much right there for the rest of the day in second place. You could fault him and say, oh, what was wrong? Why can't he get back to the lead? Well, it was not easy to pass. Hamlin had a better car at times. Um, You know, I'm not going to really bury the guy because he was stuck in second at a track where there wasn't any passing. You're all navigating lap traffic. Sorry, that's pretty good. Christopher Bell, pretty much the same story. Starts first, then we're going to pit. He is the first to take four tires. That's the key here. Most of these drivers inside the top 10 all take four tires here. Some stay out, some take two. Bell's the first. Gets himself really quickly back up front. Stay out, stay out. He leads old tires. He fades to Larson. Larson fades back to Bell. Bell will eventually lose the lead on Pitt Road, where I believe it's Ty Gibbs that's going to nab it from him. So Bell never really gets past. We're halfway through the race. Gibbs takes it. And then it's the Denny Hamlin show a little bit later. So again, Christopher Bell has a wonderful race. No real surprise there. He has been good at this racetrack. JGR was lights out at this racetrack. More importantly, the JGR Toyotas all had, or at least these had track position. Bush are starting deeper. 20th. Here we go. He stays out. Oh no, he's breaking the rules. He's breaking the code. And then he pits. But more importantly, under this third break in action, this break before, between the stages, he stays out, and that's really all he needs to do. Now, I know a lot of people don't put enough respect on Chris Busher's name, and it's going to cost you money and continue to cost you money and has cost you money, but you need to start treating this driver like an elite driver. He has always been good at Bristol, even during Roush's struggles. And I know people look at some of those finishes by him and say, oh, well, his finishing position was always much better than his average running position, so that must be luck. There is no luck to hanging on to the lead lap at Bristol. If you are able to benefit from late race cautions or finish better than your average finish at the end, that means for 500 laps, you're able to stay on that lead lap, to put yourself in position 
to strike at the end. There is no luck in avoiding the laps and laps of chaos. 500 laps of chaos. That's not luck. Bell, if I, or Be Busher, if I had to describe it, it's the tortoise in the hare strategy. He's not out there firing out the gates. And sometimes that's not the best place to be leading the pack at Bristol as you're approaching lappers. We've seen with Mulaney in 2018 and other leaders who run into lappers. Busher was always there in poor equipment. Then Brad Kozlowski shows up and we got these solid RFK cars. And wouldn't you know it, Chris Busher wins at Bristol in 2022. Did he leave the most laps? No. Did he put on a dominant performance? No. Did he lead the laps that matter? Yes. Michael McDowell has a great starting position, and then he simply just plays the strategy. Now, he does it a little bit different, too. His sequence is not quite the same, but it doesn't really matter. He starts up front, which helps. He stays out, or he pits and takes two tires. Then he stays out, and he stays out again and still is able to make it work. Chase Elliott, nothing magical here. Nothing bad here. He actually struggles early in the race, we see here. Which, again, not surprised the way that his season had been going. He fades during the front of the race. But he pits, and then he stays out. He stays out, and he holds a position inside the top ten. Not much to it. There wasn't much passing. You just didn't want to mess up. You just didn't want to fail. You didn't want to get in dirty air. You didn't want to get stuck in the back. Well, this next guy did get stuck in the back and is worth talking about, just like we talked about his teammate, Chris Buescher. Brad Kozlowski does not play the sequencing correctly. He gets a little unconventional. While most drivers will pit here, on lap 70, he does not. Or I think he maybe takes two tires, but he doesn't take four, right? Remember, Bell was the first to take four. He comes off ninth. He may have taken two. I believe he took two. So then he goes nowhere. Then he stays out, I believe. Here's the real one. He pits on lap 127 when the others did not. He pits right here. And he gets a penalty. So all the drivers in the top 10 have track advantage. This should be the end of the road. Everybody else who came up at road here gets just mired in traffic for the rest of the race game over. Not only does that happen to him, he gets a penalty. He proceeds from lap 141 to the end of the race to march through the field. No one could pass here. And he is able to go all the way to what, eighth, ninth place, eighth place. That is an impressive run by Brett Kozlowski. His teammate Chris Buescher had an impressive run. That was the best run of the race. No one was passing. Brad Kozlowski passed everyone. William Byron started closer to the front, but just didn't have the car. Faded a little bit, but again, just the old classic. Pit out, out. Stenhouse right here coming in top 10. He pits early. He pits again, which is a little bit different than you know the top tier. But more importantly, right here, a stage break. He stays out. Good restart right here. And then just holds position for the rest of the race. Nothing crazy. Just made sure he stayed out at the right time, had track position, and the race unfolded his way. A lot of times. 
We get a little too caught up in, oh, well, Stenhouse is good at Talladega and Bristol. And while there is something to that, and he definitely didn't fade, flap 140, still a lot of race left, and he was able to hold his position, but a lot of it had to do with him playing his cards right. Carson Hosever pitched twice, but more importantly, he holds out here. One of the things I really like about Hosever, and this is really telling of a part-time driver, he actually started 16th. He was able to run a good hot lap in qualifying, quickly fades. Big lights, big show, big night. Spire car may not right be there. He pits. Maybe he gets his nerves. Maybe they make a setup changes. He pits again. No real change. Now he's still outside the top 20. Still outside the top 20. He stays out. Maybe his confidence is back. He gets another shot at it. And this time he takes advantage of that shot. And runs pretty well. Actually drives into the top five. Loses some spots on pit road, hanging in sixth place. As this thing wears along, he loses a couple more on pit road, fades back, but he's not really losing positions on the track. If you look at what he did early in the race, now 400 laps in, he's confident, he knows what he's got, he's feeling good. He's going to lose a couple spots at the very end as this thing wears in, but a really strong race. Yeah, he played the sequencing correct, but that's a, a pretty good race for a kid. Ryan Priest, Alex Bowman, bottom of our list here. Just simply a matter of pit, pit out. So they didn't do the pit out, out. But nonetheless, they stay out during the pivotal moment of the race. But Walsh and Tyler Reddick are interesting. Here's what happens when you don't play it correctly. They're running inside the top 10. They decide to stay out. Now they're running inside the top five. They continue to stay out during the second caution. The stage ends. They get some stage points, but do not get the stage win. Now they have to pit. And Bubba in third, Tyler Reddick in fifth, now cycle to 25th and 27th. So just as the pit out out meant a top 10, if you pit between this break, you gave it all away. They did their best to rebound. Both ended up inside the top 15, but that gives you a perfect example of cars that were top five cars with plenty of speed. But if you played your cards correct incorrectly, you couldn't even get it barely a top 15. There they are, tracking between 14th and 17th, 13th and 14th, 13th and 15th, and that is where they were doomed to stay. And You've got two possible top five cars. And their average track position is going to say they weren't top five cars. But they were highly capable of being top five cars had they had the track position. And they might go overlooked this weekend. I doubt it. I don't know how deep people are going to go if they're going to watch this video overall. But look, these are top five cars because they had track position. You could make an argument how Gill and Austin Dillon were too, finished 16th and 17th. And Austin Dillon and Todd Gillen didn't even really do anything. What did Todd Gillen do? You know what he did. He just played the sequency correct, got the track position, and that pretty much made his day. Same thing for Austin Dillon. And Austin Dillon is actually able to overcome a penalty, which is nice. But I believe when the penalty came, it wasn't that severe because there wasn't as many drivers on the lead lap. I got to fast forward a little bit to where it is. It's right here. Because there was so few cars on the lead lap, the penalty wasn't as devastating. Eric Almirola, pit out out, played the sequence incorrectly. Car faded. Stuart Haas racing cars were just not that good. Bush, Truex, Chastain, Briscoe. Bush, Truex, Chastain, Briscoe all played the sequencing incorrectly. And some of them didn't have great cars. I think Kyle Busch and Mark Truex Jr. had better cars. But they pit right here. See? You got Truex was in ninth. He pits. You lose. Kyle Busch, he pits. You lose. Good day, sir. I watched Wonka with my son last night. He loved it. Ross Chastain was running sixth. Even the watermelon man cannot dig out of this hole to tell you how tough passing was at a green Bristol. To get that top 10 driver in your lineup 
starting position is going to matter. Eric Jones did play correctly, but I believe he has a loose wheel in the middle of a run late in the race. Can't find the specific notes, but you can see there is a untimed, unsequenced pit stop where he plummets. Blaney got it right, but Blaney had a terrible car. Blaney later would get into the wall, but Blaney was struggling before he got into the wall in this race. They just missed it. SHR missed it too. Suarez just didn't have the car either. I'm going to look at my notes. He was bad. Blaney was bad. LaJoy did the reverse. He stayed out. He stayed out and he pit. And so, like we say, that's pretty much the kiss of death. Well, that's why he finished where he did. Not necessarily. Let's give some credit to LaJoy. He stayed out. He stayed out. He pitted, which is terrible. That didn't work. And he restarted in 23rd. But you can see he worked his way back up into the top 15 rather quickly. Because one of the benefits of him was he was running in second place. He was one of the first drivers who pitted, come off pit road. So that helped a little bit. But also give him credit. He drove himself back up into 13th place. And he was going to have a solid day. And then that went out the window when he gets into a wreck in 12th place. And when he gets into a wreck, he takes out several cars with him. The cars that go with him also are uh, Justin Haley, who is going to shake up the value board when you take him off. Joey Logano, Ty Dillon, Ryan Newman. So significant, something that can't be completely ignored when we're looking at the punt at the very end, when Justin Haley gets taken out in that wreck. And Ryan Newman and Ty Dillon because J.J. Yaley ultimately ends up in the ultimate lineup. And had one of those cars survived, it's possible that J.J. Yaley is not in the ultimate lineup. Either way, it's not that extreme to expect a wreck. Speaking of wrecks, A.J. Allmendinger and Austin Sindrick wrecked earlier in the race, so that's why they had poor performances. Harrison Burton out there just turning laps. Nothing really to comment. Kevin Harvick. Like I mentioned with the other SHRs, just didn't have the car. Briscoe just didn't seem to have the car. Almirola, although he played the sequence correctly, he faded. Harvick struggled all day and all night. BJ lost the wheel and Joker got away. Hey, that explains every driver. There it is. Did it in pretty rapid time. Thank you for joining me. Blessed to have you guys around. Love you guys. Trip flight's fantastic.